Hi, I'm Casey Bell, and you're watching Writer to Writer Interviews. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Writer to Writer Interviews. Today's episode, I get the chance to speak to John Brubaker, aka Coach Brubaker, who is the writer of Beyond Stadium Status, a great book on marketing, a unique way of marketing. Let's take a listen at our conversation that we had together. All right, tell us about your book, Beyond Stadium Status. Uh, Beyond Stadium Status is the sequel to my best-selling book, Stadium Status, Taking Your Business to the Big Time. And kind of my whole belief is that uh, it's what William Shakespeare said, all the world's a stage and we're all players. And I do believe that in some way, shape, or form, every single one of us is a performer in our business and our job, our role. Um, you know, our office just looks a little different, but I think uh, you know, some of the, uh, the greatest examples of audience engagement, fan engagement, um, making a personal connection with people come from the stadium, you know, whether it's uh, coaches and athletes or entertainers, you know, on the biggest stage is selling out stadium concerts. Uh, just the ability to connect with fans person to person, one to one in a large setting, a large venue and create moments. And that's really what we're all looking for. And that as business owners and entrepreneurs, we all ought to strive for is to make connections like that. So it's the sequel that expands on a lot of the content from my, uh, my original book, Stadium Status. And what was your inspiration for writing this book, sharing your information? Uh, my inspiration for writing this book was my readers, because uh, after I wrote Stadium Status and became a bestseller, uh, I had readers reach out to me, just kind of sharing how they've deployed some of those strategies, and then asking, hey, can you do a live event? You know, we'd love to uh, come to a conference, like a weekend conference or something. So we held the Stadium Status Summit in Boston two years ago, uh, sold that out. And it was a two-day event, and afterwards, uh, the, the attendees continued to want more. Do you have any other, and they, they said, stadium status uh, type content. So I did a little bit of, you know, blogging on some, some new things around that, and I just realized, like, basically, they want a sequel. And there were some stories that didn't make it into the original book that I've held on to uh, that are now going to be in the sequel. So, um, you know, a lot of it really is just based on reader response. The original book, Stadium Status, um, was based on my experience going to concerts. You know, one of my favorite things to do is, uh, you know, attend live musical events, whether it's a, a festival, a big stadium show, uh, you know, a house concert, or, you know, just an acoustic set like at a coffee shop. I really, uh, I think that, artists, you know, entertainers, musicians are the ultimate entrepreneurs. Um, they're basically standing up there naked, so to speak, bearing their soul, you know, with the music they write and trying to create that, that person to person connection uh, with fans, you know, and that could be five people at a coffee shop, or it could be, uh, you know, uh, 50,000 in a stadium. And the strategies they use and how they tell their story and make, you know, personal moments uh, are, you know, that's the stuff that we could all stand to learn from. So I've captured some of those, uh, some of those moments, some of those strategies and stories in the original book. And, you know, that all just ties in, Casey, with my belief that your best ideas come from outside your industry. They, they will always come from outside your industry. So what can a small business owner or someone who sells real estate or life insurance, for example, learn from, you know, Garth Brooks or Kenny Chesney or Taylor Swift? a lot, you know, cause they built huge fan bases, but really they built it one, you know, one fan at a time. Right. So what drew you to the marketing um, field? How did that become your expertise? Was that something you've always wanted to do? It's a great question. I think uh, I have no formal training in marketing. It's all been trial and error. I didn't uh, grow up you know, wanting to work in marketing uh, as a kid, you know, I thought I was going to grow up and be an architect. And then I got to college. I was a psychology major, 
which uh, qualifies you to do nothing with your degree uh, if all you got was a bachelor's degree. So I went to grad school for psych, uh, realized it's not uh, what I wanted to do for a career for the rest of my life. I was a college athlete and coach in graduate school. That's how I paid for grad school. I decided I wanted to go into the coaching profession as a college coach. Spent 12 years doing that, uh, where literally the stadium was my office, so to speak. And uh, when you're a college coach, number one thing, you don't, the number one thing you do isn't coaching. That's actually the number two thing you do. The number one thing you do is recruiting. And when you're recruiting, you're a marketer. You're marketing yourself and your institution. And uh, with no formal training, you know, you don't major in recruiting. There's no uh, courses that you can take for that. So it's trial and error. You have to figure out what works and doesn't work. And um, if you look at the marketing collateral for most institutions, it all looks the same, you know, kind of the same uh, boring font. There's a picture of the, uh, uh, like the, the bell tower uh, or the, you know, the steeple at the administrative building on the letterhead and on the, 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 the college catalogs. And it's just, you get lost in a sea of sameness if you're doing the same thing everybody else is. So I looked outside the industry just to try and find some, you know, different approaches, different ideas to stand out. And, you know, when you're, you know, marketing is technically kind of in the business realm, but I really look at marketing and advertising and writing when it's done well is really, it's a creative outlet. And it's an opportunity for you to express yourself and be different. And at the same time, you know, get a quantifiable result. So that's really kind of what led me to have an interest and a passion for marketing. And when you're an author and you don't have kind of the, uh, you know, the big machine behind you of, you know, one of the top publishers in the world, let's say, you need to figure out real quick how you can build your own audience organically and market yourself. So, uh, you know, a lot of it's been kind of born out of necessity and it's been fun. It's been a challenge, but it's been real fun. I'm sure you can relate. Well, I actually have a book out called to college, not to college. And the suggestion I have, and I know parents don't want to hear it, but I don't, I think the problem we have in America is we, we live by what we're told as opposed to what the results show. And I, one of the suggestions I have in there is don't go to college after high school, wait until you're at least 25, because the one thing I've noticed when I talk to successful entrepreneurs is that their business has absolutely nothing to do with their degree and that the business that they're in was not even something they ever wanted to do, but it was out of necessity. Mm -hmm. um, there's this, I can't remember her last name, but there's this woman named Patrice. She's in Pennsylvania. She realized every time she went to get her car fixed, she felt like she was being lied to because she's a woman. So she took an auto mechanic class and she started fixing her own car. And then her friend started saying, oh, can you fix mine? And instead she started a, um, like a workshop class where you can come and she teaches you how to fix your car. And she now owns her own auto mechanic and most of the auto mechanics are female. And that wasn't something she wanted to do. She was actually working in corporate America, which she hated the job. But yep. That wasn't what she wanted to do. And I realized even for myself and most people I speak to who went to college, they say, wow, I picked the wrong degree, the wrong program. And I think it's funny because everyone, well, not everyone, but it's been proven by scientists that your brain, the part of your brain where you, you, where you make the most good decisions in your life is not really fully developed to your 21. And so I'm like, yep, so why are you asking 18 year olds to make a decision that's gonna last the rest of their life? And so I find it, when I um, saw the description of your book, I just wondered, was this something you've always wanted to do? And the fact that it's not shows that we should probably have our children wait before they just jump into college. Because most people have really, they think they know what they want, but it's really not necessarily what they want to do. I think you bring up a really important point that's related right now to this pandemic and uh, how it's kind of changed things. Uh, across the country. You know, I, I remember reading somewhere, they said that there's probably going to be exponentially more kids, high school graduates, who take a gap year uh, before they decide they're going away to college. 
you know, they might, uh, you know, volunteer somewhere. They might just get a job and work. Uh, they might become an apprentice to someone in business. And you know, I think that's probably, you know, as, as, you know, at the time that we're recording this, we're like day 160 of uh, 15 days to flatten the curve. Uh, but, you know, as much as we complain about the things that are going wrong and the challenges, that really might be one of the hidden blessings uh, for that generation of sort of this grand recalibration we have going on with everything. Well, it's, it's funny because working is actually how you become successful because when you come into problems, whether with the job or with your customers, that's how you come up with great ideas to solve those problems. And if you don't actually work a job, then you'll never know what problems you can solve. So I personally believe no one should be in college after high school, but I know we, when you've been raised into a system, you, and, and even though you don't see the results of it, because most people who go to college and get a job spend their time complaining about the job. And so I'm like, you, you spent all that money to complain when you could have did that without a college degree. Um, so I find it weird that the most successful people have that, that story that their business that they're in has nothing to do with their degree, but yet we still want our children to just jump into college. So I'm glad that you're here to share your story for people who are saying, maybe I should rethink. Um, so what was your publishing process? And let us know some things you learned in the process, because obviously this is not something sure. you wanted to do. So what did you learn? I, uh, this is my, Beyond Stadium Status is my 13th book. And I've had a variety of publishing experiences with a couple different traditional publishers, uh, zero stars, do not recommend, uh, and self-publishing. And uh, I'm more than a little biased at this point. You know, I think uh, you know, it's sort of like, uh, how, how, do you, uh, how do you respond when you've been divorced two or three times and, and to the, how do you respond to the next woman you meet? Um, you know, it's kind of like once burned, twice shy kind of thing. Um, I just worked with a couple really uh, inept publishers and they didn't understand really kind of the marketing and the PR side of things. The, the publicist, like Fifth Avenue, New York City PR firm that works with primarily business authors like me uh, really couldn't pitch a tent, much less an author. It was amazing. And uh, so for everyone who's kind of looking for a shortcut or like the fast track of, I need a publishing deal. Let me get a literary agent. Let me you know, find a traditional publisher. I don't, I think that's the old business model and it's failing. You see a lot of literary agents who are no longer literary agents. They work directly with authors and help them, you know, kind of orchestrate their book launches. I know a bunch who do that now. Um, publishing companies are either consolidating, you know, getting bought up or going out of business. And now more than ever, you see direct to consumer brands all across the country in all sorts of different industries. And I think that's the way authors should think of themselves as a direct to consumer brand because when your book is sold on Amazon, when your book is sold in Barnes and Noble or straight through your publisher in volume, you don't know who your customers are. You don't know who, and that means you don't know who your readers are. And I believe that self-publishing is the new business model for everyone. And you know, I think, you know, again, my philosophy is your best ideas come from outside your industry. I look closely, you know, for my business at the arts, music, and the film industry. Music, film, and literary really parallel one another in many ways. And uh, right now, more than ever, you know, there are artists who are in bad record deals. And with streaming, they are making one one thousandth of a cent per stream. And people aren't really buying CDs anymore, that, you know, unless it's memorabilia and it's autographed, it's a collectible. Uh, so they've had to really rely on touring as their major source of revenue. And I think authors, 
uh, you know, unless your, your name is J.K. Rowling or Stephen King, um, you need to rely on other sources than simply book sales. You know, how can you repackage and, and um, offer the intellectual property that is yours in, in a manner that isn't just a book? Books are still relevant. They still have value. But um, I think also with less and less people reading anymore, you've got to find different ways to reach your audience. And there's a great uh, story is there's a, um, a hip hop producer and artist by the name of Ryan Leslie. And, uh, you know, he's a Grammy award winning producer. Uh, his first, he, he's, uh, he graduated from Harvard. I think he was 15 when he started at Harvard. And he literally uh, handed his diploma to his dad when he graduated and said, here you go. This is for you. I'm going to go off and I'm going to start a career in hip hop. His family probably thought he was crazy, but it's what he wanted to do. You know, he didn't want to go into uh, corporate America or law or business or anything like that. So his, his uh, first album, his record, his record label, um, you know, he hit it out of the park with his first album. I think he, he, it went gold, ultimately sold like 650,000 copies or something like that. And then he produced a second album like a year or two later and it wasn't selling. And he went to his label and he said, how is this not selling at least as many copies as my first album? Like, I mean, didn't you send the link out? Didn't you, uh, you know, send marketing materials to all those people, the 650,000 people, customers that bought the first record? And they're like, we don't know their names. We have no idea who they are. And that's when he said, this is a problem that's not going away. And the best way to win sometimes is not to compete. So what he did was he went home. I think that was like on a Friday. He went home and that weekend wrote the code for an app. It's called Superphone. And it's a texting app. So you can migrate your uh, social media contacts over to texting. And it gives you a dedicated number. It's, and it's a great service for authors. You don't have to be you know, a, a, a rap star or a musician to use it. You just have to be uh, an entrepreneur. And it creates, basically, it's a CRM meets an SMS. You know, texting meets CRM. And um, it's a dedicated number, so you're not giving away your personal private cell phone number that your friends and family have. But it allows you to communicate in mass directly with your fans, your readers in our case. And you know who they are and they feel a more dedicated personal connection to you. And when your next book comes out, you can reach them directly. When your next album comes out, you can market to them directly. And I really think that, um, you know, that's the new business model. He's so ahead of the curve. Uh, you know, I got on board with that texting app and the engagement is so much higher, you know, for an author who's uh, watching or listening to this, you know, um, many of us rely on social media and email marketing and, uh, you know, the readability, deliverability, click through rate on email is declining on a weekly basis. Uh, one thing has not changed and that is that people are never more than three feet away from their cell phones. Like I'm sitting right here and I have my phone right here. We're never more than three feet away from our cell phones. We're checking them uh, religiously, obsessively. Like some, we touch our phones something like 2,000 times a day. It's kind of scary, but there's all sorts of research on this. And the deliverability of text messaging and the readability and, and you know, people will engage with text at a far greater level than they do email. So, uh, and, you know, I've seen the benefits of having that direct connection with readers simply through text. It sounds, you know, overly simple, but sometimes simple is really powerful and it allows the creator, the artist to really kind of take control back, you know, um, from whether it's your label, your publisher, whatever it is, uh, of the customer experience. You know, these people are way too valuable and important in our lives you know, for it to be left to some third party to maybe say or do the right thing when we know exactly what is the right thing for our fans. 
what was the name of that app? Super. It's, it's called Superphone. You go to superphone.io yeah. and it's a phenomenal resource. I think it starts at $20 a month and it gets you a ton of uh, contacts and texting. And yeah, I mean, if you think about like uh, every social media platform today too, Casey, uh, it's kind of, you know, they're, they're now figuring out, here's how we have to monetize things. We've got to throttle down how many people see your tweet or how many see your Instagram post. And they want to force you, like Facebook wants to force you to boost posts for your fans who were supposed to organically see stuff to actually make that same thing that was visible to everyone a few years ago, visible to a fraction of your audience. You don't have that problem with text. Everybody gets it. Right. So, yeah, I think uh, there's been kind of a seismic shift in things with that. The one thing that shocked me about publishing my books was the whole PR advertising and um, marketing. I remember going to the library, getting some books. And I was like, this is very confusing. So I said, I think I'll just hire a PR, you know. So I go to, you know, contact them and they're like, well, before we take you on, we want to know what you're going to do you know, as far as blah, blah, blah. And I'm thinking yeah. I, I'm hiring you. That's, yep. um, but they were actually expecting me to do work as far as what are you going to do the PR and what are you going to do? And I'm thinking, well, why would I pay you if I'm going to, if I'm going to do it? And I was shocked that publishing companies and PR, I don't know if there was a time when they did everything for you, but now they're expecting you to do, if not equally, the same amount of work, more work than they're doing. And I'm thinking, so then why are we paying you thousands of dollars if we can just use that money to do it ourselves? Absolutely. Yeah. I think uh, what you want with a publicist and most people don't ask this question. I know I didn't, I spent, you know, my, the first publicist I hired was for my first book. I spent $6,000 for a three month campaign and she got me placed on one AM radio show. (laughs) One. But what you want is you want someone that's got a Rolodex. You want someone that's got a deep, deep network and great relationships. What are the statistics of people who listen to AM? Well, I think, you know, one thing hasn't changed and that's talk radio. Uh, Everyone talks about how talk radio is dying uh, and AM radio is dying. Well, people, you know, like my news talk station, business talk radio stations are on AM and FN. They're streamed simultaneously. It's the same show. Um, and I think that's the case in most markets. Podcasting is nothing more than talk radio and it's like yeah. the most popular format right now. So, you know, I think, uh, you know, the, the stats are deceiving and I'm bullish on it, uh, mainly because of the demographic. I would much rather have an appearance on any kind of talk radio show, even if it's just AM, than, uh, you know, an FM morning show on the radio because the, the demographics of the talk radio listener, they're, edu- they're far more educated. Right. Uh, they, uh, are, uh, they have far more disposable income. Uh, they're intellectually curious people, which means they're probably readers. They're probably voracious readers. So, you know, I think the big thing is quality over quantity. And, you know, everybody wants to be on Oprah, the Today Show, or, you know, like whatever's super popular, Good Morning America, but I'll take quality over quantity any day. I th- well, I know that a lot of people now, I know she still has a presence, Oprah, but I don't think it's as much as it once was. She's more no. focused into her, all of her, her TV, her Weight Watchers, or all that stuff. And I don't even, I think she has a staff that deals more with her book club than she does herself. Yep. So I think that's something people need to, if it happens, it happens, but I don't think people should mm-hmm. be focused on that. No. Yeah. That, it'll come to you. Right. If you're, if you're good. So what, um, what's been some of your best like marketing or PR experiences that you've had? Because we're, we're kind of talking about how the business has changed and things that have gone wrong. And every author I know has had the same kind of nightmare experiences, either with a publisher, publicist, or both. You know, what's, what's worked really well for you? I'm always curious about that. It's difficult for me to say. Um, I'm still learning. 
I think the only thing I can say that really worked well as far as getting my, at one point, I, my original, one, my first book I published, I believe in 2008. So it's been more than 10 years ago. And my, my goal was, I want to be a best-selling author. And now my goal is I just want to find readers. I don't care about, you know, how many, I just want to find readers. And I knew the first step was not to market to people, but to specifically market to readers. Yep. So um, the two things I would do would A, I would go to the um, thrift store. I have a thrift store where you get a, a, a grocery plastic bag full of books, a dollar for the whole bag. Wow. I would put those books up and then I would, cause I have different type of books. So I would get children's book and then in once I would put it on eBay mm -hmm. or listia.com, which is similar to eBay, but they use digital money instead of real money. Um, and then when I would send it to them, I would send my, you know, a postcard or a business card or a flyer of some sort saying, Hey, my name is Casey Bell. And because I would always offer free shipping, I would say, you know, they help you pay for free shipping, check out blah, 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 blah. Um, and then the second thing is I would actually put my books up on eBay or Listia. And even though I wasn't, because my goal wasn't to make money now, because I wasn't mm -hmm. making money off of it, I would still send that book and send a, you know, thank you letter or something to let them know that who I am. But I realized my goal now was to just find the readers, not people, because not everyone reads. Um, even, you know, because I was told a few times, well, maybe once or twice, oh, you can just... Um, you know, get your, your family and friends, et cetera, et cetera. And it's not so much that they won't support you. The thing is, if they don't read, they're just not going to buy your books, period. Even, Correct. you know, if they're just not readers, they're not readers. I even remember um, someone I met at an old job I had actually bought, she is a reader and she bought my books and she, you know, reviewed them on um, Amazon, but she purchased books from my boss and my coworker. And my coworker said, oh, you can sign it. But she said, I'm probably not going to read it because I don't read books. And I wasn't offended by that. But at the end of the day, I think read authors, or especially self-published authors, have to understand if they're not readers already, they're not going to support you. And it has nothing to yeah. do with you. It just has the fact to do with it. If they're not readers, they're not going to read. And so you have to first find your readers and then find your specific readers. Because if you write a romance novel, you can't market to people who enjoy horror because yep. just, they're just not going to. So I had to learn a lot through the way. But right now, that's been the only thing that's been um, working for me. I think I'm- can, can I interrupt you to tell you how smart I think you are? Oh, wow. Thanks. I, I think it's genius what you did with eBay and Listia. Is it listia.com? Yeah, L-I-S-T-I-A.com. Uh, I think that is genius because, um, on a bunch of fronts. Number one, you know exactly the audience you are reaching. They're readers. They have proven by taking money out of their wallet, even if it's a small amount of money for a used book, by taking money out of their wallet, having the financial skin in the game and buying the book, you know they're readers. And you very subtly but powerfully positioned yourself by including your marketing collateral with that book that you sold them. And invariably, there are going to be a percentage of those people. And I don't know if you've been tracking this. I'd be curious if you know, you know what percentage of them became customers of your books. I mean, they're already customers of you, but how many of them became customers of your books and became fans of Casey Bell? Um, you know, you're basically fishing in a stocked pond yeah. and you found that stocked pond in a way that nobody else has done as far as I know. Like I talk to authors all the time. I never thought of doing that. None of them have ever shared that strategy with me. It's brilliant. Darn it. All right. You're okay. Okay. You just froze. Yep. All right. Okay. So last question, if you could have lunch in conversation with one author, dead or alive, doesn't matter which one, who would it be and why? 
I only get to choose one. <laughs> wow. I, I've never been asked that question. Um, what I find really interesting about that is uh, oh, there's so many amazing authors. I can't pick just one, but um, three, give know, me three. Top I, I three. think the person that I have to have lunch with is living author. And it's, this is tough with social distancing. Maybe I hope he's listening because someday I really do want to have lunch with him. But it's the author, James Altisher. And he's based out of New York City. He wrote the book, Choose Yourself. Yes. Uh, he is an investment whiz who decided, you know what, I'm going to take a, I'm going to take a different path. I don't want to work in finance forever. He started writing books, became an entrepreneur. Uh, he actually owns a comedy club in New York city. And he's just one of the most dynamic, uh, eclectic, probably a little eccentric like me people you'll ever encounter. His books are fantastic. Uh, and he's someone, you know, who's self published, did it himself. And his book, Choose Yourself, really was very influential for me as I was kind of blazing my trail. Um, I just find him to be fascinating. It's not, he's not necessarily a household name, you know, like a Stephen King or a J.K. Rowling or anyone like that. But uh, just one of the most fascinating people. So, yeah, I'd love to have lunch with James. And, James, if you're listening to this, I'll come to you, and I will absolutely foot the bill, and we'll go wherever you want. I, I like his story. Um, I actually used to be on his emailing list, but it became overwhelming. But I do. Oh, yeah. I, I, like, um, I like his story of how he began and then how he, be, um, he went bankrupt. And, you know, that's his whole, his whole story that he tells. And he talks about his daughter a lot. And yeah. He's definitely someone I would suggest people to, to research and get to know him more. And he's a non-linear thinker and I'm a non-linear thinker. I get the sense you are too. So yeah, that makes perfect sense. Hey, are you a writer, a songwriter, a playwright, screenwriter, author, you write articles, poetry. If you're a writer, I want to sit down and talk with you. Go to my website, authorkcbell.com and click on writer to writer interviews for more information. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back after this message. Planet Earth, there have been several famous sequels that have gone down in history as even better than the original. The New Testament, The Second Amendment, World War II, New Coke, ESPN2, Alvin and the Chipmunks, The Squeakquel. But one work of literary genius towers above all other sequels the world has ever known. Beyond Stadium Status by the great American scholar John Brubaker. It's the much-anticipated sequel to Brubaker's best-selling book, Stadium Status, taking your business to the big time. Here's what some highly respected literary critics are saying about Coach Brew's new book. It's a quick, easy read. I read it in my mom's basement in an afternoon. So, it doesn't suck as bad as it did the first time, so got that going for him. If you hate it, don't worry. It's the perfect size to use as a coaster, doorstop, paperweight, fly swatter, hot plate, or mouse pad. This book is organic, gluten-free, non-GMO, fair trade, free range, and contains no hormones or antibiotics, which means it's healthy and probably explains why it's so freaking overpriced. You know what? I think the book sucked because there weren't any pictures of color in it and that really made me really mad. I used to have insomnia until I read Coach Brew's new book. This book has gone to the dogs. Fetch yourself a copy. The new book is available at beyondstadiumstatus.com and wherever books are sold, but mostly just at beyondstadiumstatus.com.
And we are back. Let's continue this conversation. I am going to uh, just simply turn the tables on that last question. And now I'm going to ask you with my first question, the last question, the fifth question you asked me. You could have lunch with any author, uh, dead or alive. Who would it be and why? Um, Agatha Christie. Um, she's, um, well, I don't remember when it started, but I think it started, no. I know for sure I used to have a law and order addiction. And I'm very much into mystery. I'm very much into whodunit, basically. Um, I can, for the most part, never figure out who done it, but I still enjoy watching who done it stuff. And yep. I remember being introduced to her, and I've read. Um, I, it was, I think, it was because I joined a book club, and one of her books was in it, um, and then there were none. And I read it, and the entire time I kept trying to figure out. And I was like, "Oh, I know who did it." And then when I got to the end, I was just blown away at the ending. And then I read another one of her books, and I'm just so intrigued of not so much the storyline but how she finds out who did it and how they were able to do it without you know without well i'll say without me figuring it out i don't know who else can say they figured it out but i know for sure i've never figured out the ending of her books and i just think she's her, her writing skills the way she writes and the way she gets to the end is amazing yeah i find her to be a very cerebral nuanced whodunit author as opposed to many others who are not and yeah she is kind of one of the uh one of the ogs so to speak in that space i really enjoy her as well uh next question for you is we're going to kind of go back way back okay casey uh what was the first book that uh you either read or um that maybe it wasn't the first book you read but what was the first book that made you fall in love with reading, not writing, just being a reader, you know, because I think all authors, we all start out as fans. We all start out as readers. Um, that would, I can't think of, because I, I used to think reading was boring and I didn't enjoy it. <laughs> and I remember maybe five, six years ago, I started going to the library, but I started getting nonfiction books on finances and taxes and marketing and et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's what made me realize that reading wasn't boring. I, I think because I was gaining knowledge that I needed. Mm -hmm. I can't remember the first one that I read. I know that, um, I can't remember the first one that I've read. One that does come to my mind is Crush It by, um, I can't think of his name, Gary Van. Gary Vanderschuk, yeah. yeah. But I would have to say the first non-fiction uh, book that made me realize reading isn't boring was Agatha Christie. Cool. And I, in reading it, I said, I wish we would have had more, they would have in school been more open to the types of books we read. Yep. Because it was very, and even in summer reading, they wouldn't allow certain books. And it would be like, but not everyone likes, you know, certain genres. And so if everyone had the chance to read and of course, depending on the grade level, because you probably don't want to, um, you know, someone in elementary reading horror, grotesque books. Sure. But as they, you grow older, introduce different genres for so people can figure out which genre they enjoy the most, most so that they can start reading and realizing that reading is something we all really do enjoy. We just have to find the books. But I would definitely say Agatha Christie opened my mind to read more. Awesome. Yeah, I think uh, just like, uh the exploration side of things schools at least when i was in school they did a horrible job of really kind of letting you explore what you wanted to read um you know in spite of this whole pandemic and the school year kind of being cut short and kids getting sent home uh, one of the things my daughter's high school did to kind of pivot and try and make you know summer assignments summer homework whatever you want to call it fun was they changed the summer reading structure completely and they really minimized it. And they just said, read one book, whatever you want, but you know, come back and be able to report back about the book that you read and share that with your class. So, and I think when you do that, you allow kids to explore 
and it becomes a want to as opposed to a have to. You know, what do you want to read as opposed to I have to read, you know, uh, Tale of Two Cities or Catcher in the Rye or whatever, you know. Um, so, yeah, just, you know, I'm always curious, like, what's the want to for people when it came to books? Uh, next question is uh, related. Uh, who or what made you want to become a writer? I'm always curious about people's backstory who, you know, uh, are authors. Because typically people don't go to school for creative writing and set out knowing they want to be an author someday. Um, it's weird for me because I never intended to be an author. Um, it took, well, the first time I, I started writing, I was like five or six years old. And, um, but through my life, I realized, so I first started, I wanted to be a gospel singer, and then I decided I wanted to be a chef, and then I decided I wanted to be a visual artist, then I decided I wanted to be an actor, and then I said I'd probably just do graphic design. And I was changing, you know, it kept changing, 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 and then finally, I just remember praying, and God showed me during all those times of me changing what I want to be, the one thing I never stopped doing was writing. Oh, and wow. It, I wasn't writing to be a writer. I was writing either because um, I was bullied a lot in school. So I would write to write down my frustration and anger. Yeah. If, you know, for whatever. We have that in common, by the way. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I sang, like I said, I wanted to be a gospel singer. So I sang a lot. And sometimes I would make up like real songs. Sometimes I would make up silly, ridiculous mm -hmm. songs, but I would write it down anyways. Um, if I was happy about something that happened, I, happen I would journal it um my I'm um, sometimes how do I say weird when I see something like if I see a dead cat for whatever reason a story about that cat and how it became dead and the owners like I can come up with a, a, a big story just looking at a dead cat so I would write it down but I never wrote it down thinking I would be doing this as a profession yeah. I wrote it down just because it was fun it was more fun for me and um, therapy and things of that sort that made me do it. It was in, and I don't even remember why it came to me, but it was like in 2007, 2006, 2007, for whatever reason, maybe it was because I was on MySpace and I saw all my high school friends. I just began to remember all the things that happened to me in high school. Well, not to me, yeah. to students, like, you know, um, dropping out because they're pregnant, um, one student got caught in a hotel room with a substitute teacher. Um, we had a bomb threat, just different things. And I began to think about it and I stopped and said, like, first of all, well, they never sent out um, a letter or anything to our parents about the bomb threat. I don't, to this wow. day, I don't think my parents know. Um, it, it came out to be false. They found that, um, they found the boy who did it sent an email to his teacher saying, if you don't give me an A in whatever class, I'm, I'm gonna do a bomb. He sent it through the um, high school computers and the only way you can log in was you had to log in your information. So that's how they found him. So I'm confident he's not launching rockets for NASA <laughs> today. <laughs> no. <laughs> so I guess because they figured it was fake, they didn't have to alarm the parents, but I just began to think like we didn't, we didn't go, oh my gosh, this is horrible. Like it was just like, yeah regular day nothing bad happening and I said to myself why didn't we why did we just accept it as if this is stuff that happens on a daily basis so I said I'm going to write a book about it and that was my first book was writing about all the things that happened and I made sure I changed some of them I changed genders I changed names obviously sure. I changed stuff because but then again I mean the stuff that's in there is so specific I if they've read it they know exactly who I'm talking about because yeah it, it was specific stuff and that was my first. And when I wrote the book, I said, well, no one's going to publish this. Because I didn't know about self-publishing at the time. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know. I don't think the middle ground publishing where you pay a publisher to do it for you, I don't think that existed yet. So I said, well, no one's going to publish this because I'm not that best of a writer and blah, blah, blah. And so I just wrote it and I set it aside. And then my church actually had a author come in who she self-published her book, um, her memoir, um, Autobiography. So she came in and she did a um, workshop and I was like, maybe that's the way I should go. So I took all the notes and there was fear in me, of course, but I said, might as well figure this out and do it. And I've been on that path since then. So publishing, researching, finding new things and 
But one thing I do like is there's a lot more options today yeah. than there were back then and a lot more information. And that's basically how I became an author and became a writer was I was always doing it, but I did it for fun. And because my English scores weren't the best, I never had the mindset I should do this being that I'm doing it. And so. Now, I love that you didn't wait for someone to give you permission because you'd still be waiting. I'd still yeah. be waiting if we waited for someone to give us permission. Yeah. It's just, uh, there's so much drama that happens in high school. There's no shortage of content there. Right. It, it was, it was a lot of stuff. Like I yeah. said, at the time, I guess, cause I had a child mind. It didn't, like, I didn't, I never went home and told my mother all this stuff that was going on, mm -hmm. like bomb threat, you know, blah, blah, this is happening, that's happening. And the, the funny thing is, I remember I actually had that substitute and he was everyone's favorite. And so when I saw that they showed, um, one of the students showed me in a newspaper, blah, 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 I was like, oh my gosh. But I never thought to go home and talk about it or to, mm -hmm. it was just, oh, wow, that happened. It was gossip. Next day, we moved on to the next thing. So yeah. I decided to write a book on it only because even a friend of mine, well, I had, I had someone dealing with bulimia and then I had someone who actually, um, she had to go through some type of hospital because she was anorexic to the point to where she was bone thin and yeah. she left school. Well, her, her parents took her out of school. She went to some type of therapy of some sort and then she came back. But I just remember, like I said, when I was going through it, it was just, whatever and sure. then I came out of it years later looking back on it I said there's probably people teenagers out there who can use this to help with them with whatever they're going through yeah our mess becomes our message I like to say that's uh, very accurate I also think there are no coincidences is God's way of remaining anonymous like there's a reason that author came to your church yes yes 100 percent so what um what's your favorite do you have a favorite place to write and uh, where do you draw creative inspiration? I'm being selfish. I'm jamming two questions into one and making them seem really related. Um, the first, where I am now, the computer, um, okay. I just, nothing special. Sometimes I used to feel guilty because even when I write plays, they have, a, um, well, I'm sure it's shut down now, but they have some somewhere in up New York State, like near Canada, a place, I don't know, I think it's like thousand dollars a night or whatever for a weekend or whatever, where you can just be alone. And um, it's, it's one of those places where there's no electricity, et cetera, et cetera. And you can be alone. And they used to say, this is, this is what you're supposed to do as a writer. You're supposed to be a blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I can, I mean, once I have my, at least my beginning, middle and end, I can sit down and write without a problem. So I used to think, is there something wrong with me? Because I don't have all the special effects I need to write. Mm but it's usually just at the computer. Um, every now and again, sometimes I'll write notes in a notebook before I begin the actual process, but for the most part, it's just at the computer. Where I draw my inspiration, well, my fiction, it depends on the book. Um, a lot of it comes from life, my own personal life. And like I said, a lot of it comes to just, I'll be outside at a park or something and I'll see an interaction between a child and their parents. And yeah. I will make up a story that chances are it's not true, doesn't exist, it's not what happened, but because that's what I saw. Um, for instance, I still haven't wrote it. I don't think I will write it. When I used to work at McDonald's, these two guys came in and they were talking Spanish to one another, but one of them looked Asian. And so I immediately thought he was kidnapped as a child. So he doesn't actually know he's Asian. He thinks he's Mexican. Wow. Yep. And that was my story and i was like oh i can write a story and they kidnapped him blah, blah, blah. he doesn't know who he is and then you know blah blah but even though that wasn't the truth immediately that's what i saw so i can look at anything not always but some usually when i'm out look at people um examine them and then come up with a story that chances are is completely false where do, where do you think your ability to do that comes from and the reason i ask is i think uh you know, kids today, I know I sound like the old get off my lawn guy, the old guy, but kids today, uh, they just, they don't unplug and let their mind out to play and let their imagination wander. Where do you think that comes from for you that like, you can see just, you know, a, you know a, an average random daily interaction, 
between two guys at a restaurant or a mother and a child in the park. And your mind just has the ability to, to go a hundred different directions with a story. I really don't know. I think maybe it's just a, well, first of all, the difference between me and today is I remember being excited when we got our first cordless phone. So I grew up where the only digital stuff we had was a video game system, but my, it was my God, my brother's godparents gave it to him and he wasn't very much on sharing. So I didn't even really get to play with that. So most of my imagination came from me um, being by myself and like I said, writing and just coming up with imagination stuff. And then also, I was a TV watcher as a child. I think that also had something to do with it, me, because um, I'm very good at watching something and going, this would have been better if this happened. Yeah. And so I think that might be it, or it just might be something that I was born with. I don't know. But it's, it's definitely something I don't do on purpose. Okay. It just happens. Yeah, like the reason I ask is, like for me, I was an only child. And I grew up in a house where we weren't allowed to have a video game system. Uh, there was a, uh, a kind of a cap on how many minutes of TV I was allowed to watch each day or night. So like I spent, and it, I grew up in a neighborhood that was a lot of old people. So there weren't kids my age in my neighborhood. Oh, wow. So, you know, some people will call it a lonely existence, but it really, um, it really forced me to entertain myself, amuse myself, create, uh, you know, things, imaginary friends, characters, whatever, and just let my mind wander a lot. Yeah. So I'm always curious about other people's backstory and how they uh, really kind of develop that ability themselves. Uh, what's been your biggest challenge, Casey, uh, as an author? Marketing. <laughs> marketing? Okay. Yeah. The um, marketing, the, like I'm, there is this um, woman on Instagram and Facebook, but I'm not, not really on Facebook. Um, she talks about things you can do to start um, making money off your whatever you do. And she mentions you got to do more lives and um, Instagram lives or Facebook lives. And that's my, because I haven't started it yet. I'm posting like she said, but I'm not doing lives. And the reason why I have, a, I, I is like, this is easy for me to talk to someone. Sure. But they just talk to no one. And like, if you ask me a question, I can give you stuff. But for me, just to come up off the top of my head of what, you know, and I'm, she, according to her, if you, if you show up every day and you do a live and you blah, 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 and you, how do I say, connect with people as opposed to try to sell your stuff, mm -hmm. they're more likely to. So forcing myself to finally commit myself to that idea is probably the hardest thing right now and to um, continue to find effective ways to market myself, my brand, learning. Like when I first heard branding, I'm like, what? I have no clue what that is. And then learning what the difference in the beginning, learning the difference between PR, advertising, marketing, but that they're not the same thing, the difference, just learning the whole, that whole, part of publishing is the art, the marketing, advertising, PR, and the branding, and et cetera, et cetera. And then social media, because I'm kind of over social media. Like I'm yeah. literally over it. I wish there was a way I could, I had the money to buy billboards and television commercials, so I wouldn't have to do it as much. Um, but that's also hard for me is sticking with social media because I personally don't want to do it anymore. But I understand it's a part of, business no matter what your business is so yeah i think you can use social media to migrate people to a texting platform where you can have meaningful one-to-one -one conversations um that's i'm like you i'm over social media i actually think it's anti-social media especially in an election year and uh you know i'd much rather have real conversations even if it's to you know again quality over quantity smaller numbers and so yeah, I trust me, I feel your pain. And uh, so my last fifth and last question for you is, um, where do you see our industry going? 
you know, we've mentioned earlier in the interviews that less and less people are reading, you know, everything um, tends to be more, uh, you know, we're writers in kind of a Netflix world. Right. And everything's video based. Where do you see the industry going? You know, do you see it as kind of um, something that's really never going to die like AM radio? Uh, or do you see it as there's going to be a new evolution to all of this? I don't know that I can answer that question because I didn't know it would be where it is today. Casey, uh, you just told me you can make up a story about a dead cat. I think <laughs> you can answer this question, my friend. Well, because, I mean, like I didn't really, like I've, I've been through a lot of webinars um, on publishing books and yep. They, how do I say this? They're not so friendly about the original publishing as far as going with a big publishing house and the bad sides of, you know, you only get a certain percentage of, you know, you don't own your own blah, 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 blah. Yep. But there was a time when I thought that was the only way and that was mm -hmm. the best way. And even when I was self-publishing, I was still thinking about doing it the original way because in my mindset, I didn't realize in my mindset, once you give them the script, the, the manuscript, you're done. Your work is done. Of course, you have to look over the book cover to see if you're okay with it, et cetera. But I thought that was it. And so to now be in the place where most people are talking about self-publishing and that's the best route, and to know that I, I never thought that that would be, mm -hmm. to ask what's next, I mean, I'm I'm pretty sure. Well, I, I see that now audiobooks is the thing to do now because now they're telling telling me you should do audiobooks, blah blah blah. Um, so I'm assuming at some point that will probably be the thing. Um, I guess it we we would go into video books, where yeah, that's what I'm wondering. People are not necessarily books to film, but where people are creatively reading the book, so to speak. And mm -hmm. maybe you'll see some graphics, maybe you'll see some action of someone, you know, you'll hear, and she walked into the such and such, and you'll see the person walking. Um, Cause it seems like that's what people, people would rather see visually than to read and get their own vision of what is being read. Um, yeah, I, uh, I think you're right with that. I think you're spot on. And, you know, I, I always look at other industries and, I mean, that's, I mean, you just described the music industry. Yeah, you know, people listen to music, but boy, do they love music videos of that exact same song they listen to. Well, you know? I think Beyonce just with her um, video album that she just yep. released, that might be the way people are going to go, um, I guess because people like to see stuff. They just don't want to hear. I guess people want to see stuff. So maybe that'll be the next thing of, what do you call it, a video book instead of a video yeah. album where you see. I didn't, I didn't realize Beyonce did that. There's an artist that I uh, really like named Sturgill Simpson. He's kind of an Americana artist. Some people would call him country. I think he's more Americana. And he just, with his new album, just released a, um, uh, a video series. It's basically um, like a science fiction cartoon video that pairs up and kind of tells the story with each song. Okay. And, and I mean, it, it's like a short movie, really. Uh, but it coincides directly with and is intimately related to the whole album. And, you know, I think it's interesting because we sort of live in, you know, we've all got our devices and we sort of live in an iTunes world where we don't download an album. Like we used to put the album on the record player, put the needle down and listen to the whole thing. We buy singles. You know, right. we're not in an album world anymore. We're in a single world. And he's found a way and Beyonce's found a way to get you to want to listen to the entire album, not just a single. Right. And yeah, I'm curious what, uh, how that translates to the book business down the road. I think you're right. It's going to be video based stuff. And my last, was that my last question or do I get one more? We can get another. Okay. I get a bonus question. Awesome. What, um, 
is the best piece of advice you have for other authors? You know, maybe somebody uh, who is not quite as far down the road as you have traveled. Um, maybe it's like a cautionary tale of what not to do. What's your best piece of advice for a professional peer? Well, the advice I would have for anyone in any business field is to research the business side of it before you research the, the work side of it. Because when we see, you know, musicians or we see um, contractors or we see lawyers, we only see what they're doing, but we don't see yeah. not only the road it takes to get there, but we don't see the things they're doing when they're not, you know, lawyers do more than just go to court, you know, so we don't see the stuff they're sure. doing when they're not in court. We don't see, you know, what the construction builders are doing when they're not building. Um, a, a, we only see the main thing. And so I would say just research the parts you don't see. Like I said, research the, the difference between the three different types of publishing and which one you think is best for you. Research the, the PR and the um, marketing and the advertising. Research the, the book cover you know, research the editing set part of it, research the literary agent part, like research everything before you even get started because lots of times we get in and go, oh my gosh, I wish someone would have told me such and such. And it's like, well, there's books out there that did tell you, but yeah. you just saw the, the, I guess you can say the glory side of every business. Sure, the, the sexy stuff. Right? Yeah, we didn't yeah. see all the, the horrible things they have to go through before they get yeah. to that. So I would definitely say, and take the time to, um, even talking to high school students, I would say even before you go to college, call, if you want to be a nurse, call a hospital or a, a doctor's office and say, hey, can I do a Zoom call with a nurse? Or can I come in? Can I um, mirror you? Can I talk to you? Like find out stuff because there, yes, there's some things you're going to go through that no one has, but a lot of things, mistakes we make, someone already made them. So you can exactly. ask someone before you get into, you know, before you get into it to see if this is really something you want to do. So I would definitely awesome. say a lot of research beforehand. Awesome. What's your website, Casey, if people want to find out more? It's authorcaseybell.com. Awesome. Thank you. And yours is? Uh, coachbrew.com. Coachbru.com. Amazing. Well, thank you for your time. Thank you. I am so inspired by your entrepreneurial genius and what you've done with Listia and eBay. I just think that is uh, that's super next level. And you've inspired me to, to really put my thinking hat on, get creative. Like, how can I do something like that? Not the same thing, but right. something similar, like find a hungry audience and feed them. Yes, I like that. So thank you for your time. Well, that's all we have for you today. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again on another episode of Writer to Writer Interviews. Thank you for watching. Hey, if you really like this show, please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to this channel. Thank you.